Can you think of anything worse than being poor in Victorian Britain and having to live in a workhouse? How about being poor but also sick and having to stay in a workhouse infirmary? Being poor in the 19th century was struggle enough for most people, but being sick could often be a death sentence. They were not hospitals as you would think of them today, but more like receptacles for the sick poor that had nowhere else to go. Medical professionals were few. You were more likely to be cared for by a fellow pauper without the most basic of skills than a trained nurse. In this video, we hear an eyewitness account of a medical officer's experience in the Strand Union Workhouse, London, in 1855, as told by Louisa Twinning in 1898, a philanthropist who worked to improve conditions in workhouses for the benefit of the poor. The squalid conditions they both witnessed were shocking and simply deadly for patients and nurses alike. You will discover how, if you are admitted to such a place, you might never leave, no matter what age you were, for a pauper's life was of little consequence to some of these officials. And if this isn't dark enough a reality of life in those times for you, then be appalled to learn how it was not uncommon for workhouse masters to take money intended to be spent on medicines for patients and keep it all for themselves, all the while administering useless, coloured waters on the poor wretches who lay in their beds in forlorn hope of recovery. Incidentally, Charles Dickens and his family lived at 22 Cleveland Street, then Norfolk Street, very close to the Strand Union Workhouse when he was a young boy, and it is thought to have inspired the workhouse in the author's famous novel, Oliver Twist. You may also be interested to know that the workhouse, built between 1775 and 1778, still stands on Cleveland Street today, having been saved from demolition, given listed building protection in 2011 and converted into housing. I wonder if the people who live in the building's apartments today are aware of the horror stories that, if walls could talk, would emanate from them like the account of Dr. Rogers that you will hear today. Before we move on, please consider clicking the subscribe button for more content like this. If you find this video interesting, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and share it widely with friends and family. Please check out the description to see how you can support the channel and the content we make. Concerning the real condition of workhouses, I cannot give a better picture of the state of things, as they were in 1855, than quoting from the experience of actual eyewitnesses and those concerned with the management of these state institutions under the new poor law. One of the chief of these witnesses was Dr. Rogers, who was appointed medical officer to the Strand Union Workhouse in that year on the municipal salary of £50 a year out of which he had to provide drugs, the consequences of which for patients are obvious, were he a man of fewer morals. Dr. Rogers maintained a sturdy but unequal fight against the prejudice of the Board of Guardians, the treachery of their clerk, and the brutality of the workhouse master. The master of the workhouse was a man who might have been the original of Bumble in Oliver Twist. He had been a policeman in Clare Market, and had somehow ingratiated himself with the chairman of the guardians who kept an a la mode beef shop in that locality, and whose niece he subsequently married. The nurses were pauper inmates, usually infirm and more often drunk than sober, who were remunerated for their services by an amended diet and a pint of beer, to which was added a glass of gin when their duties were peculiarly repulsive. Underneath the dining hall was the laundry, with the fumes of which it was filled four days out of the week, while the lying-in ward was immediately above the female insane ward. The presence of a noisy lunatic or two, in which no doubt greatly conduced to the well-being of the parturient women. The ward for fevers and foul cases contained but two beds, and was separated from a tinker's shop by a larth 
and plaster partition only eight feet high, as to this ward we cannot do better than quote Dr. Rogers' own account. It was altogether unsuitable for the reception of any human being, however degraded he might be, but it had to be used. I remember a poor wretch being admitted with frost-bitten feet, which speedily mortified, rendering the atmosphere of the ward and shop frightfully offensive. At first I was at a loss to know whom to get to go through the offensive duty of waiting on him. At last a little fellow called Wiseman undertook the task, the bribe being two pints of beer and some gin daily, with steaks or chops for dinner. Presently the patient was seized with tetanus, and after the most fearful sufferings died. He was followed almost immediately afterwards by poor Wiseman, who had contracted from his patient one of the most malignant forms of blood poisoning I ever saw. These two successive deaths took place whilst the tinker was plying his business on the other side of the partition which separated this ward from his smithy. This place was an utter disgrace to the board, but they never attempted to alter it whilst I was there. I have referred also to the nursery ward. This place was situated on the third floor, opposite the lying-in ward. It was a wretchedly damp and miserable room, nearly always overcrowded with young mothers and their infant children. That death relieved these young women of their illegitimate offspring was only what was to be expected and that frequently the mothers followed in the same direction was only too true. I used to dread to go into this ward. It was so depressing. Scores and scores of distinctly preventable deaths of both mothers and children took place during my continuance in office through their being located in this horrible den. The male insane ward was also for epileptics and imbeciles, and is described by Dr. Rogers as ludicrously unsuitable. Immediately outside the male ward there was a continuous beating of carpets by the able-bodied inmates, from which the guardians reaped at least four hundred pounds a year. The noise was so great as to preclude any possibility of sleep, and the dust so thick as to prevent the windows of the ward from being opened till the day's work was done. Such was the condition of a workhouse infirmary in London but little more than thirty years ago. Medieval as the horrors narrated no doubt appear, we must insist most emphatically that similar conditions may be and have been found at this present moment in workhouse infirmaries in the provinces and in Ireland. Surely no act of mercy in this year of charity is more needed than the sweeping away of these abominations. More generally speaking, the character of workhouses at this time was erratic. Some, originally intended for the reception of able-bodied inmates, had adapted to the infirm, as had the Stratford Union Workhouse, but the disadvantage of having the sick and healthy under one roof was obvious. But this was not the full extent of the evil, for patients with contagious fevers were often kept helplessly in the common wards, wards in which there was less than five hundred cubic feet of space per patient. Many and grave were the reports of defects in the ventilation, cleanliness, and furniture of the wards, whilst the sanitary arrangements and provisions for personal cleanliness were often abominable. The system of nursing was carefully investigated, and found to vary between a small but fairly efficient staff of paid nurses with pauper help, and the consignment of the care of the sick to those who had been brought to the workhouse, not by disease, but by intemperance. In an immensely large proportion of houses, the sick are attended by male or female paupers, who are placed in such office without having the smallest preparatory instruction of experience and who often have the reverse of kindly feelings towards their helpless patients. As payments, they usually receive allowances of beer or gin, which aid their too common propensity to intoxication. Medical officers were practically all overworked, and a commission of the mid-1860s strongly recommended that they should be relieved of providing and dispensing drugs. There can be no doubt that some medical officers were tempted to eke out their miserable pittances by providing as little medicine as possible. 
An extreme case is that of a gentleman who was medical officer of the Westminster Union until Dr. Rogers' appointment in 1872. The philanthropist did not believe in medicine and treated all his patients with water colored in various ways and flavored with peppermint and other essences. Isolation wards were urgently required to deal with epidemics. The commissioners found a great excess in the mortality from zymotic diseases, as, indeed, could only have been expected, and also a terrible death rate among the infants born in the institutions. Wards are hardly ever constructed for such a purpose as those of a regular hospital would be, with proper attention to warmth, light, and ventilation. In some cases their position entails all sorts of miseries on the patients, as, for example, the terrible sounds from the wards of the insane. In another court, a blacksmith's shed had been erected close under the windows of the infirmary, and the smoke enters when they are opened, while the noise is so violent as to be quite bewildering to a visitor. Can we conceive what it must be to many an aching head in these wretched rooms? The furniture of the workhouse infirmaries is commonly also unsuited to its destination. The same rough beds, generally made with one thin mattress laid on iron bars, which are allotted to the able-bodied paupers, are equally given to the poor, emaciated, bedridden patient, whose frame is probably sore all over, and whose aching head must remain, for want of pillows, in nearly a horizontal position, for months together. Hardly in any workhouse is there a chair on which the sufferers in asthma or dropsy or those fading away slowly in decline could relieve themselves by sitting for a few hours, instead of on the edge of their beds, gasping and fainting from the weariness. Arrangements for washing the sick and for cleanliness generally are mostly imperfect. We cannot venture to describe the disgusting facts of this kind known to us as existing even in metropolitan workhouses where neither washing utensils are found, nor the rags permitted to be retained, which the wretched patients used for towels. In new country workhouses, the walls are commonly of stone, not plastered, but constantly whitewashed, and the floor not seldom of stone or brick also, and without carpets. Conceive a winter spent in such a prison, no shutters or curtains, of course to the windows, or shelter to the beds, where some dozen sufferers lie writhing in rheumatism, and ten or fifteen more coughing away the last chances of life and recovery. But even the unfitness of the wards and their furniture is second to the question of medical aid and nursing. Low as the salaries usually given to workhouse surgeons are, they are, with very rare exceptions, made to include the cost of all the drugs ordered to the patients. It would seem as if the mere mention of such a system were enough to condemn it. In many cases we believe it would swallow up the whole miserable salary of the surgeon and go far beyond it. Were he to give to the pauper sufferers the anodynes they so piteously require, and to the weak, half-starved, scrofulous and consumptive patients, the tonics, cod liver oil, etc., on which their chances of life must depend. Through the work of philanthropists like Louisa Twinning, medical practitioners and the support of many luminaries of social reform, like Charles Dickens and Florence Nightingale, a number of groups and societies established from the 1860s onwards, such as the Association of the Improvement of the Infirmaries of London Workhouses, began to bring about positive change by informing parliamentary commissions in workhouse and infirmary conditions for the poor. Measures included improvement in sanitary control and spacing, such as separating the sick from the workhouse and laundries from wards, adequate ventilation, suitable furniture, additional medical officers, as well as trained and competent nurses. Progress was slow and workhouses continued to be places of last resort. But the terrible evils witnessed by Dr. Rogers were largely consigned to the past.